Get off your ash. That's right, you heard me. Confronting what happened to us in the past in order to understand who we are in the present so we can be who we want to be in the future. It's time to stop allowing what happened to you yesterday to continue affecting what you do and who you are today. This podcast is going to challenge you and push you outside of your comfort zone. So if you're ready to get off your ash, let's go. Hey everybody, Joe Amaral here and welcome back to another edition of the Get Off Your Ash podcast. Now I know I always say I'm so excited about my guest today and and I am. I'm very fortunate and thankful for all the people who have come on the program so far. But today is really special for me. Um, Today I have the privilege of having my friend and my brother, uh, Oz Fox, who is the guitar player from Striper. And many of you are watching or listening to the podcast today because of him. But let me just say, this isn't um, a podcast about Striper. Of course, we're going to talk about the band because he's in it and he's been there from from day one and he has such a huge history with the band. But this isn't about the story of Striper. This is about the story of Oz Fox, the the things that he's had to endure uh, professionally, personally, you know, health crises, different things that he's gone through in his life. We're going to talk about the ash, all the stuff that he's had to go through and how that shaped him and made him the person that he is today. So without any further ado, here's my friend, Oz Fox. All right. So here he is, Oz Fox. Thanks so much for taking the time, brother. Joe, it's great to see you, man. Yeah, uh, we did this a few nights ago with the whole band with the Bible study, but now it's just you and me. <laughs> yeah, well, aren't those Bible studies great? I mean, my gosh, and the response, everybody loves them, man. I think that's the coolest yeah. thing is, you know. I mean, I was blown away because, you know, once you go off the air, you go and you check the comments and see there was a few thousand comments and people were really you know, touched by the message and felt, said they felt closer, you know, to, to Jesus sacrifice. I mean, that, that's a good day. (laughs) Yeah, man. I mean, if anything, the more wisdom we have about the word of God and, you know, the different perspectives of, you know, what people study, I mean, because your passion about details is going to be different than other pastors. For sure. And of course, with your background of being, you know, in, in Jerusalem so much and mm-hmm. really getting deep, you, you know, more things than other people do, which is incredible with your other's perspective. I mean, I don't know if that has something to do with Star Trek influence. <laughs> <laughs> it always comes back to Star Trek with Oz Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right, man. Well, let's, let's try to keep this thing on track and we'll, we'll okay. Go, all right. We'll, we'll boldly go Oz boldly go. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm there. I, I said in the intro that, uh, I know a lot of people who are going to be listening or watching today, they're here because, hey, they're the Striper fans and they know your connection and you have, you know, a legacy with the band, of course. But this isn't um, a Striper story per se. This is an, an, uh, an Oz Fox story. Um, you know, this is called Get Off Your Ash. And, you know, we talked about this before. The ash represents challenges and pain and and things that we've been through. And you guys have been in the public eye for almost 40 years now. So I know that there's been some piles of ash that you've had to you know get off over the years (laughs) and so for for those who may who who don't know striper who just you know kind of caught on to this just a brief history of of how you guys got connected or how you got connected to the band and you know how striper started real quick well i have to mention that back in 1974 i was going to a uh, junior high school called Catherine edwards i was in seventh grade and um and Robert Sweet was going to Catherine Edwards, and he was in eighth grade. Oh, okay. So uh, was there was uh, one of the teachers, an English te- teacher. Her name was Mrs. Rudge. Um, she uh, opened up her class uh, at lunch for people to come and have lunch in her classroom. And okay. if if you wanted to, you know, work on homework, or if you wanted to, who works on homework at lunch? But some people do. And mm-hmm. and then she would also set up games. And uh, and of course, there was a quad at this place where there was tons of people eating lunch and lots of noise. And and there was like a little bit of gang banging going on, you know, and whatever. And yeah. so if you wanted to if you wanted to escape and go to a quiet room, she had the place to do that. And oh. I thought one day I was like, oh, I'm going to go check it out. So um, went over there, walked inside and there was Robert sitting at a chessboard. 
<laughs> by himself. And I walked up and I just said, hey, how you doing? And he's like, uh, oh, hey, would you like to play a game of jazz? I'm like, oh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so uh, that's where I actually was introduced and met Robert Sweet. We played a how game of chess. How old were you when you guys met us? How old was I? Yeah. Uh, 74, I would have been 13. Wow, you would have been. He would have been 14. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That goes beyond 40 years or so, you know, right? It's like, yeah. That's a long time. Long, it's a long time. time. So and that of was course, your initial introduction to Robert. Yeah. And of course, I had never met Michael or their <laughs> sister, Lisa. You know, they have a sister named Lisa and um, or their parents at all. And it wasn't until uh, obviously the next year, Robert went to high school and I had to endure eighth grade uh, <laughs> by myself. And then when I got into high school in 76, you know, we were both a year older or a couple of, well, a couple of years older. And, um, you know, that was where he, I noticed he was hanging out with musicians in, in high school, uh, friends that were there that played instruments or whatever. And I got mm -hmm. to meet some of those guys, those characters. And then of course he had joined the high school rock band that the, uh, that the marching band uh, teacher or coach or whatever you want to call him. Yeah. Um, he had started a class called rock band. And, okay. uh, and so Robert had signed up for it and he got into it. And next thing you know, I see him playing in this band that, that was playing at lunch at the school, or sometimes they play at like school dances or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember seeing him play and, and I guess you had to audition. So there were other high schoolers that were, singing and playing instruments and stuff okay they had a horn horn section from some of the guys that were in the you know marching band and all that yeah, stuff yeah. and they were they were doing like stevie wonder and <laughs> you know just a bunch of cool stuff yeah yeah and um and and uh, they were called pt express okay because pioneer high school uh their their uh mascot was called the titan i guess oh, okay okay pioneer high school titans Right. It was the name of the like the it was like mascot and the yeah. way they, they called the football players that the team, the Titans, whatever. And um, so it, it, PT Express was Pioneer Titans Express. That's okay. what it stood for. So, uh, I mean, obviously, it was like really cool to see him playing then. And of course, you can't you can't forget a guy like Robert. You know, he just has a unique uh, kind of look to him. You know, the, yeah. Uh, at that time he had like a bowl haircut his blonde hair was a bowl haircut and really yeah. wow. i actually have i'm one of these days i'm gonna uh, scan the old high school i have my old high school uh uh yearbook oh, okay and, and there's a picture of him in there playing you know in oh, black and cool white picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so um that's how i got to meet robert eventually uh, i went to jam with robert at his house mm-hmm with some of the guys that were musicians at the school. And, and that's where I met Michael. And at the okay. time, Michael was probably about 12 years old. Okay. So, um, that goes pretty far back. <laughs> Eventually <laughs> Michael ended up being a freshman at pioneer high school. And I think Robert had a, may had had a, his last year there, or maybe he graduated. I can't remember, but, but, uh, um, at one point, I think all three of us were at the high school. And then, uh, and then at one point, I, I guess when Robert had already graduated and I was a senior, mm -hmm. uh, I used to give rides to Michael and his friends from high school because they lived very close to uh, a, a upholstery shop that my dad uh, uh, ran. He, he owned it and he was okay. the, the, the upholsterer in there. And, and, uh, and and they lived like a few blocks away from that upholstery shop. Right. And um, so I would give them uh, a good maybe mile and a half ride from high school to my dad's shop because that's where I go help my dad after school. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. And they would walk the rest of the way home. So that's how, uh, you know, we all kind of knew each other, became friends, mm -hmm. hang out, you know, whatever. OK, and, so how uh, long from when you guys met till, you know, Rocks regime eventually Striper was formed. Well, Months, okay, it, it was definitely a few years. Oh, really? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, yeah, because uh, that all of that I, I graduated. Well, I was supposed to graduate in 1979, but I ended up not making it and had to get a <laughs> GED. Um, but um, um, it wasn't until maybe uh, I want to say it was 19, maybe 1981 uh, that uh, I started going out to Hollywood and watching Rock's regime play because obviously oh, okay. I was still I was still friends with the Sweets. And uh, and okay. so we would we would meet up. I'd go watch them play. In fact, before it was even Rock's regime, I used to go see them play at Gazaris with different other band members with different band names, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and and I actually saw and I believe it was the first time that Michael sang with Robert in a band. Like I, in a live setting kind of thing. It, it was a backyard birthday party for no a, way. a guy from school named Chuck Alio. <laughs> and um, and and it, it, Michael had just started singing with Robert in his band oh, okay. with with some of the guys from high school that were musicians that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that we had already known and hung out with for a long time. And, uh, you know, as, there's probably that whole story you've heard before about how Robert auditioned to Michael. And uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I, I think I saw the first gig that they did together. I went to that party. Wow, man. So that was like 81 ish, you think? It could have been. It could have been 1980. I, okay. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm, it's really hard to say because I graduated, like I said, I graduated in 79 or I was supposed to. And Ooh. then it was like the next year that I think I saw them perf performing together. And uh, and then, you know, when I went to see them play in Hollywood, uh, they were already playing at places like uh, Gazari's. Uh, uh, and then eventually I saw them playing at, um, the, the Troubadour. Oh, okay. Troubadour, the Troubadour was another famous yeah, Hollywood yeah. club, uh, uh, on Santa Monica Boulevard. And, um, so I went and saw them while they were rocks regime, all yellow and black striped and whatnot. Okay. And, um, and then, you, you know, eventually it got to a point where, um, cause we all kind of still hung out together and whatnot. And I'd, mm -hmm. I'd run in, I'd run into, uh, Michael at a, uh, at the music store, the local music store one day. And, and that's when I kind of said, Hey dude, you know, I, I see you guys are playing in Hollywood. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought to myself, maybe I can help these guys roadie and maybe I can meet some guys and start oh, playing in Hollywood, funny. you know? <laughs> and so I went to Michael and I said, dude, you know, if you guys ever need a roadie or whatever, you know, I, I can. I can plug in gear or, you know, string guitars yeah. up or whatever, you know, I, I'd be happy to come, you know, help out sometime, you know, thinking I'd meet some other guys in town and in, in Hollywood or whatever, and maybe yeah. make some connections or whatever. And right then Michael kind of said, dude, we want you in the band. Wow. And, and they already known, they knew that I played guitar already and okay. they'd, they'd seen me play before. And so it worked out that way. It kind of. Well, that's cool. Like yeah, I'd heard a lot of the, the Genesis stories of Striper, but I, I didn't know that you'd offered to be a roadie. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was like there, there, you know, there's always like, who's the best musician and there's all this competition, you know, but to me, it was like, look, if, if, if we're all friends and we can mm -hmm. you know work with each other, you know, that, that might be beneficial to all of us if we can all help each other. And I still have that attitude now. You know, oh, I, I can see that. Yeah, I can see that. So, OK, so fast forward a couple of years. Striper puts out their first record. Was it 84, 83? Yellow and Black uh, Attack? Uh, Yellow and Black Attack, I thought, came out in 84, 85, somewhere in yeah, there. Yeah, I think 84-ish. OK. And yeah, then that and, starts to get a little bit of attention. And then you guys follow yeah. up with Soldiers Under Command a couple of years right. later. And right. That was the first time I was introduced to Striper was our local MTV said, oh, we got a Christian metal band. And then you guys came on with your your spandex and your dangling cross earrings and stuff. And I'm like going, what is this? But, <laughs> that's I a, said that a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, so that's a testimony for another time. But so the success of the band starts to increase. And then kind of where you guys really just went went off the charge was was uh, to help that, that like no, that no was all you know i mean i have to say those were times when we 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 knew what we wanted you know michael was writing the majority of the the, the riffs and music and mm -hmm. lyrics um and then uh I, I you know i would add in whatever you know 
I thought, you know, ideas I had, but, but, mm -hmm. uh, I think the first time I actually wrote for an album was, uh, well, we actually wrote from wrong to right together on the first album. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think Robert wrote the lyrics, Michael had all the riffs and he matched up the lyrics to the song. And then, uh, and then I rewrote the chorus because I thought it just, I okay. thought the original, I thought the original words were a little, you know, they, they didn't flow as good as it, they could. And uh, so anyway, um, it, 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 eventually as time went on, mm -hmm. obviously soldiers had its own characteristic yeah. and, Tell the devil had its own character characteristic, so to speak, and and after that, it just kind of went into whatever it turned into. You know? Okay, and, and this is where I wanted to dig in a little bit because I mean, you guys were doing. I mean, today it's acceptable, you know, for like Christian music to be in the mainstream media, but when you guys were doing it, I mean, it, it, it was different, and I'm sure there was a lot of cheap shots, there was a lot of digs taken at you. And this is where I could see the ash beginning, you know, like some hurt and some, hey, we're just trying to do the right thing here. We're trying to preach and you guys are, and it was the church, right? That was coming against you more than the world was. Well, I guess I, I, you can kind of say that. I mean, we got more of that uh, pushback uh, when we got through the Bible Belt. Uh, okay. And there was more of that kind of thing going on there. But it, but when we were in California, we were going to uh, Calvary Chapel, uh uh, uh, where uh, uh, it was in West Covina and the pastor was Raul Reese and Raul supported us. Okay. He, he thought what we were doing was really cool and was a, a, a new way that could be pe reach people, so to speak. And so they supported us and they took us mm -hmm. out and, you know, they, we did a lot of uh, high school gigs with him and he would do these outreaches at a college with us. And, you know, it was kind of cool, you know, how they backed us so much. And then, uh, but but then going into Hollywood, mm -hmm. we we took what we all the theme of the Christianity and the lyrics and throwing Bibles out into Hollywood. And of course, there were plenty of bands that, you know, didn't know what to think of it. Um, <laughs> the rock bands at the time were like, you know, just just kind of not not into there. Was, it was sex, drugs and rock and roll for most of them. Yeah, Let's just yeah. Put it that way. And uh, to have a Christian band come out and play was kind of awkward. But there were a few guys that mm -hmm. were like cool with us. You know, it's actually I mean, a good friend of mine uh, that I became friends with uh, was uh, there was a band called No Sugar. Okay. And this this guy's name uh, was uh, in fact, I became friends with most of the guys. This guy, uh, Jojo Anthony, with his, was the singer. And he's the guy who went fishing with me in the uh, in the beginning video. Of, oh, in the beginning video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was okay. the singer of No Sugar. Got it. And uh, we became friends because he lived in the same areas, like Rancho Cucamonga area that I lived in. Okay. Uh, so, um, and, th and I had moved to Rancho Cucamonga after I got married, you know, and stuff. So, uh, th it, I originally, we we're originally from Whittier. So, you know, that was a big thing. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but, but, I mean, if anything, uh, there were other guys like Ron Keel. I don't know if you know who Ron Keel is, but it, he... Yeah. Yeah, he had a at first he started off uh, with a band called Stormer. I'm mean, not oh, Stormer, okay. Steeler, 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 Steeler. Stormer yeah. was Timmy's former band. That's right. That's but, right. But Steeler was uh, that, that was the band that started uh, uh, up with uh, Ingve Malmsteen. Oh, no way. Uh, yeah. Oh, Ron geez. Keel found Ingve and uh, had him oh. come get in the band. And, you know. So that was when Ingve kind of started and made a big noise with Keel, oh, okay, with us, okay. with Steeler. And then eventually Ingve left and then they changed the name to Keel. Yeah, that's how I knew them. Yeah. Was and, he and I'm not sure. I'm not I thought sure he, was. he was. I don't, don't quote but, him, though, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. So. But, but Ron was cool. He, he was like, yeah. he, he liked us and he thought it was cool what we were doing. And there were times when Ron would play big theater shows and he, he agreed to let us open for him, which I thought was pretty cool. Okay. You know? So, so, you know, Hey, some people liked us. Some people didn't, some people just tolerated and they're like, Oh, Hey guys, what's up? You know, it yeah. wasn't always hate, hate, hate. You okay. Know? Well, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home by any means. And so when I heard about you guys, it would have been like in 1987, I was 17 years old. I was this kid checking out youth group. And then when I bought the soldier's record and follow along to the lyrics, and I remember giving my heart to Christ in my bedroom and telling my youth pastor, and they were like going, there's no way, like, 
you had to have gone to a church or something. And that was the attitude that like God couldn't use what you guys were doing. And, yeah. And, that's the way it was in the South. In the South, that's where a lot of people were thinking that they'd come out with bullhorns against us saying, you know, we're sheeps and wolves clothing. And of course, a lot of that came from guys like Jimmy Swaggered. Right. You know, and um, uh, it's just, you know, you're not going to not everybody's going to agree with what you're doing. That's all there is to it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but how, how does does that affect you? How does that affect you as a Christian well, who's trying to get out there? You know, I mean, it, it did bother us. It was kind of, but, but at the same time, you, you can let it bother you or you can go, Lord, this is, this is something that you went through as well. And you, you, if you dealt with it, we'll deal with it. You know, the, 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 you know, the high priests coming against them, the Sanhedrin or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's no different than what he went through. He probably went through a lot more, obviously he got crucified. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I think there came a point where um, I, I, I think we, we all kind of got frustrated with having to have to be these role models. Mm -hmm. and, and that became a big uh, burden on us that we felt it was, it was it, it, like our own church was, you know, get on us like, you know, about things and not necessarily raw, but some mm -hmm. of the other pastors would get on us and say, you can't do this. You shouldn't be doing that. Blah, 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 blah. blah. And so we got a little bit of that kind of flack from yeah. uh the closest ones you know and um and at some point we kind of cracked and it was like you know heck with this man we're just gonna and that's when we did the against the law album. against the law like 1990 1990 yeah yeah we kind of all went through this period of just kind of frustrated rebellion yeah. and um and and I don't know. It was just a very strange time. All of us kind of slipped into this mode of, you know, well, I don't care what the church thinks anymore. I'm going to yeah. do whatever I want. I mean, you, you sat on your ash at that point. Yes. Right. Years right. of people just pushing you and, and you're shaming you and talking bad about you. After a while, you're just like, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to, I'm done. I'm sitting on here I'm, and I'm finished. Yeah. And I, and I got thinking about that because that affects your faith. It affected your family at the time, right? Going through yes. that kind of stuff. Right. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I, I can only speak for myself. Yeah. Um, I know that during that period, I, 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 I started like drinking a lot of beer, you know, mm -hmm. and when you, when you mix alcohol with a Latino, it doesn't get, you know, <laughs> um, it, <laughs> Chicanos. <laughs> 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 um and and you know my poor wife for my first wife leslie you know she was we we had two kids at the time and mm -hmm. it, it was tough on her and and um you know there was uh a lot of stress and you know a lot of stress with me going on the road and leaving her with the kids for yeah. you know months on end and and then you know if i'd come home and get crazy and party it up a little and you know it, it just wasn't a good mix and i i really had to come to grips with myself uh at some point but that really didn't happen until michael left the band when right. michael left striper to go do a solo thing that's when everything came to a halt mm -hmm. and um and at that point there was no band to to go out and tour with mm -hmm. um and i had kids to feed and you know a house payment or you know yeah. rent to pay or whatever yeah. and um so I ended up going to a, a temp agency and I got a job working in a warehouse mm -hmm. and uh, there was no more striper at that point. Um, and uh, so, so I had to go through a period of, okay, Lord, if this is what I got to do, I'll do it, you know, to take yeah. care of my, my family and my, you know, my needs or whatever. And uh, the, the good thing was they moved me up pretty quick. I became a supervisor real fast. Because mm -hmm. I, I did have warehouse experience from, you know, before I was even in Striper. And um, so I latched on to it pretty well. But I mean, those some days were 16 hours, yeah, uh, you know, of loading trucks and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's just crazy. And, I hear uh, you. Yeah. And I yeah, remember yeah. when I was pastoring these little churches, Oz, you know, and driving a forklift at a candy factory, you know, to pay the bills, making yeah. jelly beans on the side while preaching on Sundays, you know, and you do, you do, you do what you got to yeah. do. But I mean, I mean, Striper had 
really gone up into the stratosphere, right? And I mean, you're yeah. you're up and you're you're flying high and doing great, and then you know, boom, yeah, it all comes down. And if you're not if you're not a, a strong person, if you don't have a, a solid faith, I mean, that can really knock you down and cause you to sit on your ash for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, if anything, for me, it was pretty heartbreaking to think that I went from playing in front of thousands of people to loading up a, you know, a, a container that's going to China, you know, with, I worked for uh, JBL professional okay. speakers and yeah. we were, the manufacturing company would send trucks of stuff that we'd have to put away in stock. Mm -hmm. and stock. And then we'd have to load them on trucks, you know, in the, in the um, shipping department. And it was just crazy, you know? And, and, and I remember, there were times when I had been into it, working there for, you know, I don't know, probably good six, seven years. I'd, I'd wake up in the middle of the night on my days off or whatever weekends, and I'd go walk around the neighborhood and look up at the, at the night sky because I couldn't sleep. And I'd be going, Lord, what what's going on? Why am I here? What's, you know, I, I just didn't understand. I, I thought to myself, it, it, I, I need to. I need to figure this out. I mean, if, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just, I got the wrong heart, you know? And, and so I spent a lot of nights doing that. Wow. And, and, um, and then all of a sudden, I think uh, what happened was we got the offer to uh, uh, reconnect uh, at, at a uh, Striper Expo that uh, right. a guy named Rich Serpa wanted to put together. And, um, and there was a lot of controversy about whether it was going to happen or not. I mean, Michael was, you know, doing his solo career and he didn't know mm. if he really wanted to kind of go that direction, but he agreed eventually. And we, we pulled it off and did it. And, and as time went on, more opportunities came and, you know, and eventually it turned into a reunion tour. Yeah. You know, and when the reunion tour happened, there was still a lot of question of whether we would be re uh, joining together again and mm -hmm. making it happen. And that would have been around 2003 when that reu yeah. first reunion tour happened. And then it wasn't until 2005 that we actually started recording again and doing albums. And okay, uh, you know, and so it's kind of like, um, I don't know, like like a second wind for Striper, and then you you went through a difficult time your first marriage kind of th that that ended a while before that right that ended uh it started its path of ending around probably between 2003 2004 was when okay you know uh she and i were having problems and uh and then eventually it led to you know uh, us splitting up and divorcing and finalized the divorce in 2006 Wow. January, January of 2006. And See, that was really hard for me because yeah. I really, I really treasured having a family together. Yeah. And I didn't want it. My, my parents divorced when I was, you know, little, you know, I was very small. Mm. And so I always wanted the opposite for my family and my kids. And it just didn't work out. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of the things you have yeah. to remember. Um, and, and I have to blame myself. You know, I don't put any blame on anyone but myself for not really being the leader in mm -hmm. the family like I should have been. A terrible example. You know, losing my, my patience, losing my, I mean, I have anger issues. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, 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 but, but the thing about it is through that, through that heartbreak, the Lord reached me. And, yeah. um, I, I I got on my knees before him and just said, I'm yours, Lord. I, I'm just going to accept whatever you, you know, whatever I put myself in here, I know you're going to get me through it. See, dude, that, that's a Job moment, though. Job lost everything. Yes. He lost his family. And then he sits there for a while. And at the end, he finally says, God, I'm ashamed of what I become. I repent for sitting in the dust and in the ashes. And the Bible says that after he prayed for his friends, that God restored to him everything and blessed him. The latter half was better than the first half. And I see God doing that in your life because then he brings you this incredible woman that has is walking this journey with you. So tell me about getting remarried, telling me a little bit about meeting Annie. And because I know her, but maybe a lot of people don't don't know your your guy's story. 
Well, Annie, you know, she um, she was already going through her own um, job experience. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, her own journey of coming Ooh. out of prostitution and and uh, and then wanting to help women uh, get out of prostitution. Right. And whatnot. And um, it just so happened that um, I was friends with a guy named uh, Kevin Max. Uh, Kevin was one of the singers of DC Talk. DC Talk, yeah. We're still friends. I shouldn't say was, yeah. but we're still yeah. friends. But but um, uh, it, it, Kevin lived in Las Vegas around in sometime around the 2005 uh, time uh, year, I should okay. say. And uh, I don't know how long he lived here for. It wasn't a very long time, but just long enough for us to get together and have dinner when I was coming out here to rehearse with Robert. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, so we got together for dinner. And I met this friend of Kevin's. Her name was Heather Veach. And okay. Heather had Heather had a ministry uh, that uh, um, w reached out to strippers because she was a former stripper. Got it. Okay. And so I became friends with Heather. And we we at, at this dinner, you know, he, we were sitting there talking and all, you know, mm -hmm. kind of talking about different things and whatnot. And and then Heather um what I, I became MySpace friends with Heather. That was when MySpace was the big thing. MySpace. You know? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. That was when all that was kind of yeah. popular. And, and, it, and so yeah. I became MySpace friends with Heather after that. And then Heather, they, back then, MySpace could, could have, you could have top friends. Oh, okay. Like, as much as 40 top friends and their faces would come up and whatever. Well, Heather only had like four top friends that she posted. And mm -hmm. one of them, one of them said was ex hooker Annie Lobear. Okay. And you know, there's a picture of her smiling, you know, and and I'm like ex hooker Annie Lobear. I, I clicked on it and I read this testimony of her life mm -hmm. and what she'd been through, and it just yeah. blew my mind, you know. So, um, you know, I I decided to try to become friends on MySpace with Annie. With Annie. <laughs> and I just back then you could be you can do a friend request and also send a little note. And okay. uh, I sent her a note saying, Oh, Hey Annie, I, I just hung out with your friend Heather and okay. I saw your page here. And I thought, you know, Hey, I know what you, you both of you guys are, she, you know, Heather had a ministry to strippers Annie mm -hmm. had a ministry of prostitutes. And I said, I said, you know, I could, I could imagine the church is coming against you with all kinds of junk. Mm -hmm. I said, if you ever want to talk about what we went through, cause Striper was doing the same thing right. going into I said, I'd be happy to talk to you about it, you know, and just, wow. just hit, hit me up, you know, and and I kept it all in my space. I didn't try to get her number. I wasn't trying yeah, to like, yeah. hit on her or nothing like that, although she she thought I was trying to hit on her. <laughs> and That's a different so story. Right, <laughs> yeah. So right away after she got the message, she calls Heather up and goes, who's this Oz guy? He says he met you. <laughs> and Heather says, because, you know, Heather and I talked for a good three or four hours at okay. that dinner. With, with Kevin and Heather tells Annie, Annie, that's your husband. Whoa. So Heather's the one that put the bug in her ear oh, about yeah. me and what I'm like, because she knew all the guys Annie's been out with. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to her, after spending a little bit of time talking and, you know, obviously we shared a lot about the Lord and our faith and, you know, all the different things. Heather kind of got that in her head that I would be a perfect fit for Annie. Hmm. And so that's what she said to Annie. And then of course I got an approval on the friend request and eventually yeah. Annie and I kept going back and forth with messages. And eventually I met her here in Vegas. Okay. Uh, actually in Boulder city. Um, Cause I went to jam with some friends that offered, asked me to come out and play at a, at a little place out there. And uh, so I invited Heather and Annie to come see me. Well, Annie, oh, Heather couldn't come, but Annie showed up, but she showed up with a guy. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey. <laughs> and it, not that I was, I wasn't trying to yeah. get with her, or, you know, imply anything. I just thought it'd be cool to meet her in person. Mm -hmm. She shows up with a guy and I'm thinking, oh, this must be your boyfriend, you know. But it wasn't. He was like a former guy that she dated. Not okay. Seriously. And uh, he went to her church or whatever. But uh, but, you know, I met her and she was really super sweet and mm -hmm. took pictures. I still have the pictures, you know, wow. that night. And uh, I remember the night. It was February 2nd, 
2008. Wow. You know? So, I mean, awesome, you know, to, to know that, you know, that kind of all happened at a, at a time, a point in time. And, and then eventually uh, that same year, 2008, I, I had another gig that uh, was in, I think it was in October of uh, 2008. And mm-hmm. I invited her and Heather again. Well, Annie was the only one that showed up. And uh, we ended up spending the whole night out at a 24 hour restaurant just talking. Yeah. And then I went to church with her the next day. And then we hung out the rest of the afternoon after church, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really, I mean, just a sweet little time with her in the very beginning. And, you know, I didn't even, I just gave her a hug and, you know, when when I left and it was real innocent, you know. And, uh, those were memories I'll never forget, you know. Oh, I could imagine because, you know, <laughs> of what you had been through, you know, with family and marriage yeah. and the band up and down and everything that she had been through. I mean, y'all both went through an incredible time of ash and that could have destroyed you had you sat on it and stayed there. But I think it's so beautiful that she went through her journey, you went through your journey, and then God kind of brought you guys together. And now, you know, you're doing your thing. She's doing her thing. We're going to have her on at some point and have her share, you know, her, her story. So I don't want to Uh-oh. give that all away. <laughs> what? Uh Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying that because I'm afraid of what she might say about me. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, you'll, have, you'll have to tune in and find out. Huh? <laughs> but, but I think it's so cool because, you know, it's like God said to Job, you know, once they came to that that moment of repentance and decided to pursue him, he says, now I'm going to reward you. I'm going to make the, the second part of your life greater than the first. And so you guys get together, you get married, Striper starts touring again, you start making records. Um, I remember connecting with you guys probably in 2015, I think at the first fan weekend in Nashville. Okay. Yeah. I think it was 2015, maybe 16. I don't, I don't, I don't recall. Okay. But um, yeah, things are going well. The band's back on the road. You and Annie are happily married. Things are going great. And then, you know, I was part of that, that Striper text group. And I get this message, pray for Oz. He just collapsed on stage. <laughs> and everybody's yeah. like going, well, what do you mean? Like, did he trip? Did he like, what happened? And nobody knew anything for a while. And so walk me through it because it's just like, you know, you're on Ash, you get off and then you're on Ash, then you get off and now boom, you're back on Ash because you, 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 you pass out and walk me through a little bit of that journey. What, what ended up happening with that? Well, well, okay. So this has to, we need to back up a little bit because we had just finished up doing the 30th anniversary to hell with the devil tour in 2016. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shortly after that, we took the whole year off 2017 and um, I got, um, I got, I, I decided if, if we're not going to be touring, I might as well, since I'm in Vegas, try to get involved in some of the entertainment here. So I got into a cover band that was playing on Fremont street every uh, Sunday and Monday evening. And, um, so, uh, I started doing cover band stuff mm-hmm. and eventually that led to me playing in a lot of different places in town. And I was playing at uh, carnival court at Harris, which is an outdoor, uh, kind of, um, bar area with dancing and all that stuff right on the strip mm-hmm. and um, and so I was playing there with this band that does covers called the Sin City Sinners and uh, obviously I'm you know <laughs> I'm just I, I'm going where the sinners are right to, right. to be an example <laughs> okay so anyway um, we were playing um, covers and it was we had to get to 1230 because we had to play like right on the money. That's the way those places are. You have to play mm-hmm. right from one point to another and then from that point to another you know, okay. time. And so we were trying to get we had played two sets already. We we're playing the last set and I had to get to 1230 and we were playing rock and roll all night by Kiss. Right? Mm-hmm. So it was probably I remember looking back at the clock and it was like a couple minutes before 1230 and we were right at the end of the song. Mm-hmm. So we had to we had to try to extend the song a little bit after the guitar solo. OK, and I'm look. That's when I looked at the clock and I knew it was around that time. And about we're about ready to finish. And next thing you know, I come back into the chorus mm-hmm. and I thought I was playing the chorus to the song, which I played a million times. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
and I guess I wasn't playing it right. And uh, the drummer's still playing, but the bass player kind of stopped and looked right. at me. And everybody's looking at me. I must have been singing something wrong. I don't uh, recall. My brain was like snapping. Something mm -hmm. was going on. Yeah. And and then next thing I knew, I I completely blacked out. Boom. And and I all I remember was waking up to Oz. Can you hear me, Oz? Who's the bass player going? Can you hear me, Oz? Mm -hmm. And then finally, I woke up going, yeah, I can hear you. And he goes, you just had a seizure and uh, we're sending wow. you to the hospital. So apparently I was standing there playing and I just blanked out okay. and went black. It was a grand mal seizure. And okay. I fell, I fell forward. Uh, at the I, Good thing I didn't land on. I didn't fall off the edge of the stage. Right. I was I was close enough too, and it was like a drop, about a six foot drop. And um, I I. I was, I just kind of went stiff and fell forward with my guitar and the, the guitar actually I landed on the guitar and uh, it's the guitar saved me from breaking my ribs because it had a kind of oh. like a it had a piece of wood sticking like a piece of plywood sticking up on the edge that was about that you know that mm. thick and I would have broke my ribs had I just landed on it and um, but I guess I just hit it with my guitar and bounced off and and then uh, uh, once I got revived uh, they asked me if I could stand up and, and uh, you know, walk off the stage. And I said, I think so. So they helped me get up and I walked off. Yeah. And then I heard everybody start clapping because I was walking. Right. You know, <laughs> right. They put me in a put me in a gurney, took me to the hospital, did some scans on me. And they found two tumors in my head, one in the back, um, mm -hmm. the back uh, uh, left. I'm sorry. Right. Right. right hemisphere. Okay. Right hemisphere towards the back. And uh, they also found one behind my left ear. Mm -hmm. So the one in the back ended up being in the brain uh, at, towards the outside. So they were able to, when they did the surgery on me, they were able to just take it right off the outside. And, um, and that was a whole, that's a whole other story. That um, was a crazy surgery when you were awake playing guitar, right? Well, okay. So the position of the tumor <laughs> would have affected me in my left arm. I could have lost the use of my left arm. Right. And the only way to safely pull it out would be for them to perform the surgery with me awake playing the guitar. Wow. And they had to take like an electrode and test the area before they cut. And these, these, this, this electrode put yeah. out a very low dose of electricity and whatever part it touched, if it affected something on my arm, my arm would freeze or go off or whatever. Whoa. And they would know that that's brain and not to cut it. Wow, that's crazy. So so this is how he did the surgery. He would test the area. If mm -hmm. it didn't throw me off from playing guitar, then it he does. would cut through. Oh he would wow. cut through. And he had to do that. He did that for three and a half hours. And 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 uh they had me awake with my skull off. Oh you know, man. over on ice. <laughs> what? <laughs> they put the skull cap on ice. On ice. Yeah. I did not know that, dude. S sterilized, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and, and then they did the surgery. I played guitar the whole time. And then finally, when he said, okay, we're done, you know, wow. and, and then they put me back to sleep, put me, closed me up with some titanium clips in so it wouldn't come yeah. apart. And, uh, and then I woke up the next day with a little bit of a headache and it wasn't a big deal, but the definitely whatever they cut, mm -hmm. uh, I remember after I was well enough to get up and pick up a guitar, like a week later. Mm -hmm. I couldn't even play a chord. No way. Yeah, it was really weird. It it would had to take time for my brain to reconnect enough for me to even play a simple chord. Wow. And and, and uh, so I mean, you know, I I mean, I knew that was going to happen, and it wasn't it didn't bother me. I just figured, oh, I'll give it some time, and you know, that's kind mm -hmm. of the way I that's kind of the way I think. But um, but but you know, so uh. As time went on, it, it, it became, you know, it got better and better. And eventually, three months later, I was playing and recording with the band again, you know, doing the uh, Soldiers Under Command live in the Spirit House. Dude, if you can believe that. That's insane. <laughs> I mean, you, you say it like it's not like it's nothing, but I mean, you know, you just kind of are recounting it. But that's quite the experience. Well, let me, let me tell you something. When I oh. went in there, it could have went either way. I mean, I could have yeah. lost everything. I could have lost yeah. my life. Yeah. You know, I could have went, you know, bye bye. But but I mean, I went in there and there were so many people praying. 
Uh, I and I, and, and around, I yeah, yeah, there was a just a ton of people. Annie, my wife, she's like the the prayer gatherer, and oh, yeah. she was online telling everybody what was going on, and everybody was praying. I mean, I yeah. had people, I had people going into the Canterbury in England and putting a prayer up in the mm-hmm. prayer request uh, tower yeah. or whatever they have. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. Yeah. And and dude, when I went in there and they were getting ready to 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 you know put me to sleep, I just felt peace. I felt so much peace. Yeah, there was no, I, if, if there was any, th- that was the most peace I've ever felt in my life. And it was like, you know, I don't have anything to worry about. I mean, even if I don't make it, I knew where I was going. Wow, man. You know? So, I mean, that's the kind of thought I'm, I try to be kingdom minded as much as possible. Yeah. And, Love um, that. and, and so, um, got through it, you know, it's like now that I'm alive and able to still, you know, perform and do whatever, uh, I, I know I have a purpose and, mm-hmm. you know, all the little stuff doesn't matter anymore, you know? So I would imagine that, that was, perspective. yeah, that, that was the first challenge. The other challenge was to get through oh, the, other the acoustic yeah, the aroma one. surgery and the left ear. Cause that was attached to my vestibular nerve going to my cochlea of my ear, my inner ear. Mm-hmm. And there was no way they were going to be able to uh, save my hearing. Okay. with that so i ended up being completely the nerve got completely cut out because the tumor was actually growing out of that and out of the out of the nerve and it was starting to kind of push against my uh my brain stem Ooh. and uh and so that that was getting dangerous and they felt you know we better just get in there and, and the good thing was it was a uh a cystic tumor so it was more fluid than it was oh. solid okay and um, so so they were able to clean it out. The guy uh, we, I went to UCLA for the one awake surgery one, yeah. and, I, and I went to uh, UC San Diego uh, for those doctors. They were specialists on this side for the ear. Okay. And both surgeries were successful. And uh, and here I am today. To OK, but this one is there's still effects for you, right? Well, OK, so here with when you lose your vestibular nerve, that your inner ear is what helps you balance. So right. um, what happens is, is if, once you lose that nerve, your brain has to all of a sudden compensate for it with mm-hmm. whatever you have left on the other ear that's still working. And um, so that's a challenge. I mean, I still am a little, my equilibrium's definitely off mm-hmm. a little bit when I walk. I mean, it's weird because I'll be walking on a straight flat surface and I feel like I'm walking downhill. Oh, okay. Which is very strange, very strange feeling. So when I'm on stage playing, obviously I can't really move around too much because I might fall over from my balance. Wow. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, you're like in a metal band, like you're used to doing this. <laughs> yeah. If I do this too much, I, I throws might, off? I, it throws me off. It, so it, do you have to be like conscious about it off to say, don't bang your head, like just focus it, on the riff? Well, it's a little hard because, you know, the music's going and I want to do yeah. this. You know, <laughs> but but then but then if I do that too much and I go to do a solo, I might go to the wrong uh, fret and I'll play <laughs> it in the wrong key, you know, because it's not right. You know, <laughs> that's already yeah. happened already a few times. I'm like, oh, God, you know, I'll see it videos of me playing like the the uh, I think I played the the more than a man solo one time and a whole step up. <laughs> you know, and like I didn't realize what was going on. And then all of a sudden I tried to fix it. And it, it's just. And the guys are like, ah, don't worry about it. It's okay, you know. Yeah. Well, I know <laughs> the, the fans are just they're they're super, you know, happy and excited that you're still able to do what you're doing. And I mean, you know, when we talk, I forget sometimes what you've been through because I mean, you're just you seem like a hundred percent. I mean, you, you don't complain about it and go, oh, why me and this and that. Your your, your faith is such an example, not just to me, but I know to a, to a lot of people, how did that affect your faith Oz, going through these experiences? Well, I, you know, I've had many uh, <laughs> uh, times of being in the ash brother. And mm-hmm. many, many of those times where I've had to just say, Lord, I'm in your hands. I trust you. I know you're going to take care of me one way or another. And somehow God would, pull me through i I did i don't know if i told you that the story about my uh uh when when 
I, uh, I got sent a guitar. Mm. Uh, uh, I was going through my divorce with my first wife and I was working at the warehouse and I was okay. doing inventory and I had a pile of, a pile of work and guys were coming in with problems and everybody's just like on my case. And then all of a sudden I get a phone call from my ex ex wife, soon to be ex wife at the time. And she's giving me all kinds of problems about this and that and mm -hmm. yelling at me and crying. And then all this, I'm like, I hang up the phone that day and I'm like looking at this, the wall going, I can't take this anymore. Mm. I can't do it, Lord. I mean, I, I take me away or I, I got to yeah. do myself in or something. I can't handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then within five minutes of me saying that, one of the other supervisors walks in with a box and sets it down right by my desk and goes, hey, this came for you. It's got your name on it. I'm like, what the heck? And then it was like a tall box. Mm -hmm. and, I, and he was there and a couple other guys who knew what I was going through were there. And they knew what I was all about in my faith. Yeah. I opened up the top of the box and there's a, a guitar case inside and it is a yellow note. And I open up the note and it's from this guy uh, um, that I had spoken to in a chat room years before. I, I told him, he asked me what my dream guitar would be. And he said, he remembers me saying on the note, he says, he remembers me saying that a Silver Sparkle Telecaster was, was uh, my dream guitar. Mm -hmm. And uh, because Don Rich from Buck Owens played one. And, <laughs> okay. and, and, uh, um, uh, and he said, and I'm sending you this. I found this at a, at a pawn shop and I'm sending you this because um, the Lord told me to tell you that whatever you're going through, he's going to get you through it. Wow, man. And I opened up the guitar and there was a beautiful silver sparkle Telecaster, which I still have. It's still in the storage downstairs. And wow. it's, it's a testimony at that point, all these guys in the office are going, Oh my God, right. <laughs> they're, tripping. Right. they're tripping. And at that point, you know, it was really strange when I saw the note and read his note note and, it was like God going, what are you worried about? Yeah. Don't worry. I'll get you through this, you know? And instantly these big, um, um, these burdens just lifted off. Yeah. It was like, you know, it just was amazing. And, 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 and so sure enough, I got through all that. And, you know, now uh, Annie and I and my, uh, ex-wife, my first wife, uh, Leslie, mm -hmm. we're all friends, yeah. you know, we're all friends and we, we go out to dinner whenever we're in different, our which is amazing or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And you can't, it's hard not to get along with Annie. She's, you know, <laughs> she's amazing too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, Hey, I'm blessed to even have that, you know, to have that. And then, you know, obviously we still have kids together and now we have grandkids and, mm -hmm. you know, we can all meet at the grandkids birthday parties and have a great time and yeah. you know, reminisce and, and all that. And she still knows all the striper guys. Cause she was there from day one. Right. You know, so whenever we're playing in Colorado, cause she lives in Fort Collins near Denver, mm -hmm. she'll come to the shows and she's like, Oh, Hey, it's good to see you guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. You know, man, going into the conversation, you know, you kind of have an outline and you know, you know, the points you want to hit and stuff. But just hearing the similarities of, you know, the ups and the downs, you know, the, the flights and the crashes and just seeing how you've been able to, you know, remain steady and everything and your faith has been unwavering. And uh, it's just such such a testimony. And I know that there are people watching this, you know, who, who tune in because, you know, of the Striper connection. But I'm really believing that people hearing what you've been through and how you, you still have your faith in God, you still call on him. I, I'm really believing that's going to speak to a lot of people because this is going to go around the world. That, that's the beautiful thing about, about doing these podcasts through Zoom and stuff. I mean, you can just put them online and who knows where this is going to end up. So I, I just want to thank you so much, man, for, for sharing your time, for sharing your heart with me and just being open and honest about, you know, some pretty serious stuff. I appreciate it, man. Well, I'll tell you what, no, uh, uh, this is one of my things I always think, and this is for everyone to think about. If you know Jesus, you get the most peace in your mm. life ever because you know he's going to take care of you if you're faithful to him. He promises that. And so, you know, just by acknowledging that he's Lord and that he's in the driver's seat of your life, 
you'll yeah. you'll find that peace and he'll help you find the person that you're really supposed to be in him and that's kind of been my thing is to share that with people as much as possible and and just to be a person that has the purpose of being in a band like striper where i can sing a song like yahweh and put my hands in the air and watch the audience do the same yeah that just blesses my heart so much so there's purpose for me that's right and i know there's a purpose for every one of that's listening mm -hmm. the, the same and maybe in a different way yeah. You know, maybe there's a purpose for you in something else that's very important in the Lord's plan for you. And you just got to follow that and find that peace. Because if you do it your own way, you screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <And> you do. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. listen, man, like I said, I just so appreciate you being, you know, honest and open and transparent and sharing and uh, I love you, man. And I can't wait until we can uh, get back on the road together and see what God will do in the future with Striper and with you. Absolutely, bro. I love you too. And, uh, you know, just uh, be blessed and blessings on your family and your wife, Karen. All right. Thank you, Oz. All right, buddy. Thanks so much for joining us on today's podcast. We hope you found it informative and encouraging. For more information about Get Off Your Ash or to order the book, you can visit www.getoffyourash.today or just search it out on Amazon.